Um, I was going to also um, think that that relates so well to uh, the second point that you had. And I wanted to see if we can transition to that one. Um, no and that's this one. It's like we talk about the the foundation, right? There's this foundation of this emotional foundation. And I think that like when we're talking about academics, we often say, oh, they need to catch up. Maybe they're behind in this subject. But unless we deal with the emotional foundation, it feels like there's just no way that these kids are even going to start to catch up. Like we're talking summer school and stuff. How are we <laughs> going to even um, build that foundation for them so that we know that they're going to be able to succeed in this type of scenario? Right. So well, what, what kind of basic uh, foundation do they need? Yeah, well, I think it's learning how how to think and how to problem solve. So there's two types of knowledge that people need in order to think um, um, critically. There is procedural knowledge, right? Systematic steps, like you know, think mathematics. Mathematics is, uh, you know, it's a sequence of algorithmic steps or algorithmic steps that you take in a sequence in order to um, solve a problem. If you don't know what that procedure is, then you're gonna get stuck and you might quit, right? So that's one thing. So it, it's some procedural knowledge, but there's declarative knowledge, known facts, okay? And so I think that we have to meet people where they are. Um, wait, 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 so help me understand that. Like, what's the difference between procedural knowledge and, and like facts? Like what, what, what is the, the distinction here and what does that do? <laughs> okay, so, all right, so um, um, declarative knowledge are facts. Okay, and procedural knowledge are the steps for problem solving, are the steps that you would take, like, you know, um, on procedures, you know, procedural knowledge. Oh. Does that make sense? Okay, so like one is just like the facts, the, the solution, and then the other one is how do you get to the solution? Right, so that's why I said earlier, you know, engage them in frameworks for thinking. When you teach someone how to think, then there is no learning loss. Then there is no, um, you know, they know what to do or, or they know how to find the answer. Right. So I think that that is what we need to do. And so, and, and the same thing goes for our emotions. Um, I wrote an article before the pandemic, um, I believe. And, you know, it's the algorithm for being able to work through your emotions. Number one is you need to know what emotions are. Two, you need to know how to um, identify them, right? Recognize them. And third, you have to find um, strategies for, you know, regulating. So if I'm a teacher, one thing I can do is I can do an emotions um, check-in. And the check-in can be a formative assessment that I can do it in regards to whatever my learning goal is that day in the classroom, whatever our final product is, or maybe something is happening in our children's lives. If we give them an algorithm, here's a check-in, then you label. I like to use um, Plutchik's Wheel of Emotions because it helps learners see that there's um, eight basic emotions and that other emotions are an amalgamation of those in tandem with, with other ones. And then once they start to recognize and label what's what what they're experiencing, then finding a strategy for self regulation, it's a lot easier, right? And so I just think that focusing on routines, on systematic approaches, frameworks is very important. And I think that as a teacher, well, as a coach, that has helped me tremendously because my learners always know where where we are in the steps. And sometimes you can't solve a problem right away, but like as we know in STEM, it's not always about the final product. It's about the knowledge that's learned or is constructed or built upon along the way. And I think that's equally important. So if we are incorporating or embedding reflection for metacognition th throughout each activity, then there's never a learning loss. You know, I, I love this. I'm going to add up a, like something I just wrote down. Name it to tame it, right? Like that's what we're talking about. That's the name of the game, right? Like being able to speak to those emotions, man. Like being able yeah. to have an emotional type of literacy. This is the thing is 
We are so literate on writing, reading, you know, arithmetic, but how literate are we with respect to our own emotions? Like we think like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, I just feel stuff. I'm just angry, sad. I'm like, no. Do you know the the eight emotions? Oh, just and by the way, I'm gonna ask you, like, maybe you can just quickly go through some examples of like the the examples of the names and and yeah. some examples of how you get that started because this is the hard part for a lot of parents is they don't know like how do I even get started with this and you know how there's um some people talk about like an anger ladder right like mm -hmm. the, you know there's different stages and and people use like characters or something like I would love to know like what do what do people use to develop this emotional literacy and so one thing I have to say is this is that when it comes to helping young people their emotions whether you're a teacher or a parent you can't take a lead learner approach on this one mm -hmm. so in computer science we have this thing or this mindset um, even in stem that that the teacher is the lead learner and i think code.org may have coined that or they've lifted it up in you know on their website or some article and so that makes sense because you know, I want to say most, I could be wrong, but most of the computer science and STEM teachers don't have a background in engineering or in CS. And so they're teaching something that's out of their wheelhouse. And so, yeah, they, go, they are going to have to learn alongside with their children. However, I think that that's true. But when it comes to coding and things like that, these are earned skills. Thinking is skilled work. It's not something that you inherit. You're not naturally endowed with this. And the same thing goes with mastering emotions. Like if you look at young people, um, I think little kids are more in tune with, with their emotions because they're present with their emotions. And I you know, learned this through um, Eckhart Tolle's work. In his book, A New Earth, he says that if you observe a child or even a duck, all right, let's start with the duck. If two ducks are having an argument and you see them in the pond, right? They have their thing and then very quickly it ends and they fly into or, or they swim into different directions and they shake it off and they move on. And so he says that if you look at a young child, they're very present with their emotions and they cry, scream, kick, whatever they have to do. But then after 15, 20 minutes, they're back playing again. What happens is wait, wait, wait. so you're saying like we we eventually learn to suppress our own emotions and that's why we're so disconnected. That's why we've got all these like problems today. If well, okay, so I can't go that far, but <laughs> I'll, you know I can just go on my personal experiences. If young people don't have a conscious adult that knows what emotions are, knows how to label and recognize and manage, then for their own defense or for their own um, protection, because everyone gets hurt emotionally, you know, some worse than others, but they block it out as a defense mechanism. Unfortunately, if we don't learn how to feel it to heal it, if we don't learn that, then it doesn't really go away and then it's stored trauma. You know, there's emotional trauma, there is psychological trauma, which sometimes we need some help with, but regardless, it doesn't really go away. And so the thing is this, the adult can't be the lead learner. The adult has to do that inward, outward work, that inward work, that self work on themselves to then be able to engage and coach. Huh. You can't help someone understand themselves, their environment and other people if you yourself don't understand yourself. And so that's why we have SEL and, and we have these things in schools but I think it's important that parents and educators also do that work first on themselves. And so when we have a, a tool like Plutchik's Wheel of Emotions or even emojis, and we're helping young people see, hey, there's anger, there is pain, there's anticipation, there is joy. You know, I know that for me, one of the biggest aha moments, um, well, as a younger person, I always felt that I had to respond to every situation. You know, I'm from Queens, mm. Far Rockaway, Queens in New York. And if someone said something or looked at me in a certain way, 
part of the um, culture there was that we meet that head on and we address mm -hmm. it immediately. And so, and so the thing is, as I got older and I started to move into, into different spaces where that didn't really happen, it wasn't part of the culture, like, you know, university, work, it was frowned upon. You know, that was no longer a strength be, 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 because it wasn't always done in the right way. And so, you, you know, I didn't know any better. That well, level of control is so important. I remember like right. even our own school, like we had a uh, an incident where like one student could email like the entire school. And we've got a lot of students in our school. Like ours is a 10x school. So we've got 5,600 students just in, in our one online school alone. And so you could send like a, uh, an email to every student in the school and people were so angry. They're like, stop sending these messages. And they're like, it's a K to nine school. So they're really young. And my message to them was, you know what, if anyone on the internet, and this is the thing about the internet, it's like, it causes people to be angry a lot. <laughs> and if you are, if you react in anger, right? Like if you're going to react because like you got angry about something, then pretty much anyone on the internet can control you. And it takes time to develop that self-control, that self-discipline, uh, that regulation uh, that people have. And before we move on, because you, you mentioned feel it to heal it, and that's our next session. But I want to, before okay. we do that, uh, answer one more question from Roger. Um, this okay. is a little bit longer one. I hope it'll fit. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, thank you. Uh, very helpful. In some cultures, praising young children is less of a focus and high achievement and humble attitudes are stressed. Is there a way to encourage young children to achieve, but stay humble, but also uh, encourage them specifically? And there's, yes. there's more, I can't, I can't really fit the rest in it, um, but it says specifically our experience raising children in the US or Chinese multicultural communities, uh, bringing yeah. into contrast two different cultural traditions in achievement and finding creativity, uh, finding a balance on that journey is very dynamic. It's a great question, Roger. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, so, um, Roger, I can only answer that from my own perspective, right? And so, one of the things that I did with, with my child, um, my child, I did provide praise where he deserved it, right? But I focused more on living encouragement um, as, you know, as he was growing up. And there was one time that I found out that he teased another kid at school because something that the kid was wearing. And so what I did with my child, I, I took him to where I'm from, Far Rockaway, Queens in New York, and, in, and into the projects um, you know, that I had um, experience walking through as a kid. And I took him on my street, I showed him all of these things. And I basically, for him being humble, I, I taught him this. You were born on third base, but you didn't hit the triple. You didn't really mm -hmm. earn that. Like privilege or whatever you have, you know, you you've had to earn that. So you don't really have the right to treat anyone um, in the wrong way. And so mm -hmm. I think that you can you know, for parents that are raising children that are in a different context than we were, I think to keep them humble. Right. I think we need to show them where we started and show them what the possibilities are and to focus on, of course, on achievement, on being smart, on having solving problem strategies, you know, little recipes, but also on understanding that the things they do for themselves, their achievements. Right. These should be tied to their passions, things that they care about, you know. Mm -hmm. But they should take yeah. those passions and flip them in service of others to help other people. So if you're trying to help people, you're not going to be looking down on them. And so I think that 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 is one of the things that, you know, I try to instill not just in 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 my participants or in my own children, but I think everyone should is to find out what you like to do. Something you would do every day, become an expert at it that 10,000 hour rule, but then, but then flip it and turn it into a purpose for helping other people. And I think that will keep anyone grounded. I, I love it as well. And, and you can see like Roger's already like responding to this one. It's like, yeah, but you're, 
like you don't understand your privilege until you bring them into that context that you can yeah. show them like you don't understand like this is how difficult it is for some others and giving them that context of like you have to understand this is where you come from and you're talking about humility it's like humility comes from understanding like where do we come from you know everybody who says like oh i've made it but i still remember who i came from where i came from where, where did you come from what does that mean and i think yeah, that that's and, key. it's so key uh, you're hitting it on the nail like here i love yeah, it <laughs> well, well and that's one part but the other part is that we have to teach our kids about empathy um and i know that empathy is often you know defined by putting yourself in someone's shoes I, I don't know if that's possible, but I think we can learn to see the perspective of another person, that we validate what their position is. It doesn't mean we agree with them. It doesn't mean that we subscribe to it, but it means that we try to understand where they are coming from. And I heard a young person say in a video from, from um, the Bronx, New York, that if everyone had empathy for each other, we'd all be friends. You know, there's a mm -hmm. quote that I heard once that if you, that there isn't a person you wouldn't love if you just heard what his or her story is. And so I, I just think that, you know, teaching our kids about empathy and trying to see some from someone's, um, you know, um, point of view, I think it goes a long way in making them, you know, better people.